Our next speaker brings to the conference a rich background of experience as a consultant and as a leader in implementing quality management practices. Peter Schultes' professional background in organizational development has provided valuable insights into what is required to transform the environment, the relationships, the group dynamics, and the management practices of an organization. The cornerstone of his work is educating managers, managers on theory, skill, methods, and tools needed to guide the efforts of their employees. Peter Schultes is probably best known for two valuable contributions to quality management. The first is his work on how to incorporate a quality philosophy into pay, reward, and feedback systems, an alternative to performance appraisals. The second is the team handbook, how to use teams to improve quality, which has sold over a quarter of a million copies. And he's currently working on a new book, which is aimed at doing for managers what the team handbook has done for teams, and we'll look forward to that. Here is a man who has been very helpful in addressing the question that we all want answered, how to. At four previous OQPF conferences, Peter Schultes has talked to us about how to avoid using problem-causing performance appraisals, about how to develop effective teamwork, about practical approaches to improvement, and practical approaches to change. And today, he will speak on some practical approaches to the manager's new, new job. Peter Schultes, welcome back. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ben. And it's always wonderful to come back to, uh, to OQPF and to the International Deming Users Group. Um, there's a story that Brian Joyner tells uh, that I think is a perfect illustration of systems thinking, uh, the approach to systems that Dr. Deming was talking about. And he attributes it to Ben Carlson, who assiduously denies having anything to do with it. Um, so I'll tell this story, and I'll still attribute it to Ben Carlson, but you, you've been warned that it has nothing to do with Ben. But it's a story looking for a, uh, a hero. I mean, it's, so if one of you is willing to step forward and, and admit that this story is about you, you could probably live in perpetuity every time this story is told. The story is this. And I, uh, supposedly, Ben uh, went out, and he had bought a new pair of shoes and was on the factory floor. And somebody noticed his new shoes, and they said, Ben, I see you got some new shoes. How much do they cost? And Ben's supposed response was, I don't know. I haven't finished wearing them yet. <laughs> so as I say, it, didn't, it wasn't Ben. I mean, Brian and I have been telling that story and attributing it to Ben. And then finally last year, Ben said, that wasn't me. And, uh, so we need somebody to, to be the Ben of that. So it would help if your name was Ben, because we've gotten sort of used to uh, <laughs> using the name Ben. But it's an important point that, that uh, it, when, when you have internalized looking at life as a system, then something as simple as buying a pair of shoes is not a single isolated event that you can measure by a price tag. It's something that has antecedents and consequences. And the more we can see everything that we do in terms of its antecedents and consequences, then we can understand the complexity of life and of work and also what it takes in order to do a good job of leading that complexity. Um, I'm going to take the liberty to jump around the notes a little bit. For instance, I would like to begin my talk on page 17. That way I can end sooner. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths of, of quality. And this whole talk, I think I developed because I was getting tired of hearing people present things as essential to the total quality movement that just weren't. At best, they were nice, but not necessary. And some of them were just plain wrong. But let me quickly skim through some of the myths. Um, one of them is that man managers of conventional American organizations care about customers and quality and employees and costs and profit. 
uh, as Dr. Deming says, nobody gives a hoot about profit. That's, I believe that's theorem number two. And, and, uh, and, and we see it all the time that, that we have the rhetoric of quality has finally invaded the country. Marketing people have certainly learned how to spell the word quality. But when we look at the day-to-day -day practices of quality, there isn't much indication. I'm, I'm afraid there isn't much indication that American business in general understands what quality is all about and understands how to, how to lead and learn how to do it. And then, and then what flows from the quality are all these other things, profits and, and customers and the rest. Uh, we, don't, we just don't get the connections. The second myth is that quality begins with improvements in the workplace. Improvements in the workplace are essential, but as Dr. Deming said in his, the diagram that he presented in Japan in 1950, quality starts with the customers. We must understand the customers and their needs. Quality also begins with the design of the products, with the, with, with the discovery, the innovation of, of quality and finding uh, products and services that our customers can't even anticipate at this point. And, and, and that's where quality begins. And then with not only the design of the products, but then the design of the systems by which products and services are delivered to our customers, are manufactured or, or, or developed and then finally delivered. And then once we have those in place, we can uh, begin the continuous improvement. But I get nervous when I hear people describe quality as synonymous with continuous improvement. If you begin quality just simply at the stage of continuous improvement, you leave out a whole lot of people who are essential to creating a quality organization, the people who design the products, the people who design the services, the people who design the production systems. So I, uh, I get nervous when I hear people talking about continuous improvement. The third myth is that for the U.S. to be competitive, the American worker must give his or her best effort. Dr. Deming's theorem number one is we're being ruined by best efforts. The presumption behind that statement is that the systems are okay if everyone would do his or her job, we could do better. But as Dr. Deming has said, if everyone did his best, we would eliminate maybe 5% of the quality problems at best. Also that, that U.S. Uh, to be competitive, must, the, the workers must be motivated by managers. That, that bothers me a lot. How are we going to motivate workers to do quality? Um, it presumes that workers are not motivated, that they don't start out motivated, that we have to infuse motivation into them. My suggestion is, and, and many others, including Frederick Hertzberg, is that people start out motivated. What we end up doing is sort of uh, sucking the motivational juices out of them and uh, leaving them sort of neutral. Also that we have to be empowered by managers, that workers have to be empowered by managers. That, that phrase bothers me too. I don't understand what empowerment means. There was a great cartoon in the paper, a little girl talking to her father saying, I want to be empowered, whatever that means. And, and I, would, I would ask each of you to take a vow that you won't use the word empowerment until you have operationally defined it. If I walked through a, a factory with empowered workers, what would I see differently that wasn't there before? Here's a, at the heart of what bothers me about empowerment is that if you're thinking in terms of the hierarchical organization, then maybe empowerment makes sense. The people at the bottom of the chain of command who have been traditionally deprived of participation in decisions, even though they're very close to a lot of important information, need to be empowered. That's fine, but we're not talking about a hierarchical organization. We're talking about a systems view of the organization. And what does it mean in a systems-minded organization to have people who are empowered? For me, the word empowerment only makes sense in a hierarchical view, and that's what we're trying to get away from. Also that workers must strive to be outstanding performers and that manager, managers should reward the outstanding performers. Um, that, that too is an obsolete view and that has nothing to do with the quality movement, although I hear lots of managers talking about that their, their quality programs involves, uh, involve the rewarding of outstanding performers. Fourth myth might sound strange coming from me, 
that teamwork will lead to quality. I think, this, uh, I want you to keep buying the book, but I think, uh, <laughs> I think we've made too big a deal of teams and teamwork. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And I have heard managers say, we've started our quality program, we've got you know, 47 teams doing projects, um, which is usually a, a kiss of death. Set up this proliferation of projects, which individually might be nice things to do, but are not supported technically well enough to know how to do their projects. They aren't supported managerially enough to know that, that these things will indeed be followed up on. And then while individually they might be nice things to do, collectively they go nowhere. So I would warn, I should put a warning label on the team handbook saying, uh, teams may be hazardous to your organizational health or something like that. Um, that, that be judicious and wise about the use of teams and teamwork. I'm more interested, in fact, in the, in the environment of teamwork, in a company-wide uh, breaking down of barriers, in a company-wide interdependence, in a com com company-wide systemic view of the organization. And when that is, when that's established, then the teams will also be important. Even before that's established, teams will be important. I'm just worried that we set up too many teams. And I also worry that managers of companies use the establishment of teams, project teams, as a form of abdication of leadership. You know, I've done my job. There's all those project teams out there. Now I can go back to doing whatever it was I used to do. Also, myth number five, the quality means continuous improvement. Um, why have I got that in there twice? I don't think I'm going to have to uh, combine myth number two and myth number five. But at any rate, at least it, it offers me the opportunity to make the point twice and emphasize it. Um, we all learned a lot from the Pontiac Fiero tape in the early days that was, seemed to be the best example that we had at the time of, uh, of a plant that knew how to do improvement, that had learned Dr. Deming's message. And the Pontiac Fiero plant failed eventually, but not because of the, um, the, the lack of improvement. They knew how to improve. The, the failure of the Pontiac plant uh, was at the leadership of General Motors. It takes more than improvement. As Dr. Deming points out, you can, Im you can improve the process at the teller's cage in the bank, but that won't keep the bank from failing if they make poor loans. So those are the myths. Let me now return to the beginning of the notes and talk briefly about some of the principles at the heart of quality. And this will not be saying anything new. By the way, just before I begin, it's a little daunting to stand up here and, and, and speak to you about quality and know that before me, um, Dr. Deming is up here. And then later this afternoon, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Kano. Um, it, it's, it's sort of like I, if, if I were up here talking about basketball and there's Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan, I, I, it would be almost less intimidating than this. Uh, everything I've learned about quality, just about everything, maybe 95% of what I know about quality, is either from Dr. Deming or Dr. Kano or their students. They are two giants in the field. And, um, and, and, so, and their predecessor, uh, Dr. Kano's predecessor, Dr. Ishikawa, is of course the giant in the field. But these are the men who have started the quality movement and contributed greatly to it and will continue to, to contribute greatly to it. And, and um, I, can't, I can't overemphasize how important the, this is. I have said it before and I'll say it today. The quality movement is more than just the reindustrializing of America. It's more than just a, an economic revolution, I think. I think the quality movement, because it emphasizes the things I'm going to talk about, places new values or, or re, re, gives rebirth to old values that are important to our society. Instead of being greedy, we talk about uh, sharing. In, instead of looking inward at ourselves and satisfying ourselves, we talk about looking outward at customers. 
Um, instead of having an attitude of let's get away with whatever we can get away with, it's let's look for, uh, for perfection, let's look for precision, let's constantly improve. These are not just business values, these are life values. And I think as these principles spread, not just for, throughout business, but as they spread to our families and our schools and our government agencies and throughout, the, throughout all of our society, it has the beginnings of what I would call a new renaissance. I think the contributions of people like Dr. Deming and Dr. Ishikawa have given a, a new um, a, a new point of view, a new paradigm, if I may use that word that some people are learning to hate, uh, uh, to, to our way of living. So let me talk about what I think is at the essence of this movement as I understand it from people like Dr. Deming and, and Dr. Kano. First principle is that, is that the customers and their needs shape the organization and its work, not the other way around. The definition of a good product is, is, the source of that definition is the customer. In the past, we have defined what was good. If, if it satisfied the engineers, it was good enough. If it satisfied the marketing people, it was good enough. And often that had very little relevance to the customers. It was the job of, of various people in the organization to convince the customers that that was the product that they wanted. And, and the starting point now is the customer. Customer in thinking is the jargon way of expressing that. And, and we have become much more sophisticated about customers, who customers are. We recognize that there's a chain of customers, for instance. Um, one of my clients is a paper company that sells its products to a merchant, which sells its products to printers, which uses the paper to to, for its customers who are publishers of various kinds of magazines or catalogs. And those magazines or catalogs go to those customers who are gonna read them, and on and on. Now who, my paper company client, who is their customer? Just the people they sell the paper to? No, they are smart enough to know that every step in the chain of customers is an represents somebody important to their company, somebody who have, has needs that need to be satisfied, and if they're going to get feedback from the customers, they have to get feedback from every step in the chain of the customers. There's two questions that help me frame what we're trying to learn from our customers. One of them is, are you getting what you need? And the other question is, do you need what you're getting? So one way of framing what we need to do for our customers is to assure that they get what they need and to assure that they stop getting those things that they get from us but they don't need from us. Um, the second principle at the heart of quality, oh, let me say one other thing about customers, and, and it's an, another way of saying something that Dr. Deming said earlier. Um, we, I think we need to define what our customers get from us, not in terms of the product that we sell or the service that we offer, but in terms of the capability that they, that they acquire from us. Conica Camera Company, I've used this example before here in Cincinnati as well. A Conica Camera Company described themselves as being in the camera business, selling cameras to people, but they, they, they were dissatisfied with the feedback they were getting from their customers. The customers were saying, oh, you've got a wonderful camera. And of course, in the new quality mentality, uh, customer complaints are treasures to be sought. We want to find out what what makes people unhappy with our products or services. And while it's nice to hear compliments, uh, those don't exactly help us to define how to serve them better. So, so somebody in Conica Camera was brilliant enough to, to redefine the business they were in. They were not in the business of manufacturing and selling cameras. They were in the, in the business, excuse me, of selling the capability to take photographs. So they sat down with their customers and their customers' photographs, and they found out that the customers loved the camera, but the customers couldn't take very good pictures with this camera that they loved. And as a result, they developed all of the self-focusing mechanisms and the film forward, the automatic film forwarding, and all those things that, that allow folks who are relatively inept, like me, to take pretty good 35 millimeter pictures uh, because they're selling a capability. And so this, the, the capability of accelerating an automobile shifted from buggy whips to accelerators. The, 
the capability of fueling an engine and so forth. Those are, so what, if you were to redefine your business, the businesses that you lead, um, how would you define them, in, not in terms of the products or services that you sell, but in terms of the capabilities? For, the, for educators, this is a particular challenge. What are the capabilities that your customers need? Because those capabilities affect various times in their lifetime. So that's a way to think about what we do. By the way, before I go on, I'd like to find out a little bit about you um, to the extent that I can see you. Ah, that helps. Um, how many of you are CEOs or one step away from CEOs in your organization, the top executive in your organization? Okay, I can barely discern a sprinkling of hands. How many of you are managers at all, have people reporting to you? Okay. How many of you have been doing one or another version of total quality for, um, let's say, less than a year? More than three years? Okay. So let's... Uh, there, there's no clear patterns out there. Uh, at, at any rate, so, so I, I was trying to see whether I should pitch my remarks at, at top execs, and I wasn't, I'm not surprised to find out that there aren't too many top execs or near top execs here. I will rely on you to carry the message back to them. Or make sure they come next time. Let me talk about the third dimension, uh, the second dimension of quality, the second principle at the heart of quality, and I won't dwell on this because Dr. Deming spoke about it uh, quite a bit, but it's, it's absolutely essential that quality comes from the processes and systems, not from inspection, not from exhortation, not from rewards and sanctions, but from the system, and we have to understand systems. Um, it's, and it's one of the major contributions that Dr. Deming has made to, uh, to world thinking and to the thinking of uh, organizations. I'm going to return a little bit to that later on. Excuse me, let me go to the third point. I'm going to spend more time on this one page and then I'll skip around the rest of the pages after the page one. The third principle of the heart of quality is making quality the all-consuming focus of the organization. When Dr. Deming went to Japan, Dr. Japan was known for schlock. Japan was known for plastic, usually extruded or molded plastic products that were cheap, sort of Cracker Jack box type toys. There's a town in southern Japan called USA, spelled USA, so that they could stamp on the bottom of their cheap products made in USA. They, they named themselves that after World War II. I had a chance to talk to some of the Japanese consultants and I asked them, did they ever change the name of their town back to something else? And no, it's still USA. However, they don't stamp that on the bottom of their products anymore. It's, <laughs> it, it is no longer a marketing advantage to have that stamped. So Dr. Deming taught the Japanese that quality had to be the focus of their organizational plans and strategies. And then, of course, he taught them the first couple of principles that you start with the customers and you build it into your systems. But in the chain reaction that you have all seen, um, a, a picture of which is on page, um, I believe, five. Yes, you'll see a picture of the chain reaction on page five. The starting point, this is, Dr. Deming used this in Japan, the starting point of the chain reaction is um, quality, not the decreasing of costs, that's the second point, not improving productivity, that's the third point. And what Dr. Deming is saying is you don't get the other things legitimately except by the use of quality as he describes it and defines it. We didn't need Dr. Deming to teach us that it's important to cut costs. We do that, we try to do that all the time, but the trouble is we cut costs usually at the expense of our customers, at the, by, by compromising the integrity of our products or our systems. So we know about cutting costs the wrong way. What we don't know about is how to cut costs by starting with a focus on quality. So I also see managers saying, we're following Deming's principles, we're cutting costs. And then I have them talk about the, the first box in the chain reaction. 
Something that happened to me this fall, as some of you may know, I had uh, the privilege of going to Japan, to Japan, no, excuse me, to Russia. I'm trying to get my pointer out, and I, and I can't do two things at once. Uh, I went to Russia in November and, and, uh, and read, uh, brought with me a, a letter that Dr. Deming had written for them. And, and what he emphasized to the, to the Russians, whose economy, of course, was in chaos then, and it still is, he emphasized the importance of them becoming a system. So that goes back to point number two on page one, the, the, the qualities in the system. But he urged them to see the whole, the whole uh, area of Eastern Europe as a system. One of the things that's killing them, not only literally but also economically, is that they are not creating win-win systems view among the republics of the former Soviet Union. But the other thing that happened was, that I found interesting was that a, uh, the, not only was the systems view something that was appropriate for them and they understood that and that meant a great deal to them, but also this diagram meant a great deal to them. Because now they're, they're trying to privatize their businesses, they're trying to use the profit motive uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the profit system to, to build their industries and their, and their businesses. And, and they're trying to leap down to these things, increase market share, uh, stay in business, provide jobs and more jobs. And um, so and the reason they do that is so that as a, as a government entity, they can have uh, the increases of business to be, and, and the return on investment to be a source of taxation. They want to tax businesses. Also, they want to have more and more jobs so they can use income tax as a source of revenue for the government. Um, and I pointed out to them that what Dr. Deming's teachings say to them is these things are nice, but you don't get there without starting here. Russia has to learn how to make products that are competitive in their quality with what the rest of the world offers. And so to start out thinking about how they're going to tax incomes and tax corporate profits is starting at the wrong end of the continuum. It's a little bit like making a dog happy, trying to make a dog happy by grabbing its tail and wagging it. You have to start at the other end of the system. <laughs> now, it's, it, it's, it's a little more blatantly primitive in Eastern Europe and in Russia, but it's also almost equally primitive in a lot of American companies, a lot of American companies who try to jump to the tail end of the chain reaction. By the way, you'll notice that there's dotted arrows between this box and this box. It's because Brian Joyner added the last box in the chain reaction and Dr. Deming approved of that, but it's to show that, that Dr. Deming's chain reaction ended with the provide jobs and more jobs. But if you continue that logic to the next step, you come up with uh, Brian Joyner's addition. The fourth principle at the heart of quality is that an organization achieves quality by mastering the methods of improvement. Um, one of Dr. Kano's students has been with us at Joyner Associates for the last year. <laughs> Excuse me, and before that he visited us periodically. And, and we, as a result of learning from him and learning from him those things he learned from Dr. Kano, have, have grown immensely in our understanding of what it means to improve. Um, the improvement is, uh, is much more complex and much more uh, technically a precise set of activities than we imagined before. And, uh, and, and we're, we're learning fast and trying to develop ways of teaching it so that others in the country can benefit from that. But, but we're just in the foothills, I think, in this country of understanding what it means to improve and how to improve. Um, the fifth principle of the heart of quality is that an organization pursuing quality directs and focuses its energies. I'll spend a little bit more time on this in a minute, but it's um, mostly, mostly what we don't do well in this country, even companies that are pursuing total quality pretty earnestly, is we haven't learned a way of taking all of the possible things that we could do that would be improvements and narrowing them down to a few. We haven't learned how to do what Dr. Kano says, 
We haven't learned how to go an inch wide and a mile deep with improvement. We mostly go an inch deep and a mile wide. So I'll say a, a little bit about that in a minute too. And then finally, to summarize it all, the sixth principle of the heart of quality is that there's a whole new way of thinking about leadership. That leadership is not what it was. That, that the leadership of all of the above five principles is, is a, qualitatively different. I believe it's the first change, I'll use the word again, paradigm change in, man, in management since 1850. In 1850, we began a new way of managing because we discovered the resources that allowed us to have mass production and mass distribution. And so between 1850 and, and it sort of culminated in the time of, uh, of uh, Frederick Taylor and Henry Ford, we learned how to do mass production and mass distribution. And then we've made some slower evolution since then. But I think that began in 1850. I think we have a, a, a wholly new uh, set of managerial and leadership needs that have resulted from what Dr. Deming began in Japan in 1950. So I can talk a little bit about that. But I've given you the basic outline, and I'm going to skip around for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and then allow some time for questions. On page three, you'll notice these two diagrams. I use that to elaborate on the notion of quality as a system. Um, Dr. Deming spoke about this earlier. I think this represents the, as much as anything, it represents the, um, the watershed uh, shift in our thinking. That we are used to thinking in this way, these are not just two charts, they're two ways of thinking. We have to shift our minds from thinking in terms of hierarchy, of chain of command, to thinking in terms of a system. Doctor, this is the drawing that Dr. Deming used in Japan in 1950. This drawing was first used in American business, as far as I can tell. Dr. Deming says it comes from the Prussian army, and uh, I, I believe that, but, but uh, as far as I can tell from the reading of history, the, the application of this diagram to American business began in 1850 as a result of a train wreck in Massachusetts where, where um, the, a commission that was organized to study a train wreck uh, came up with the conclusion that not only here's what we ought to do to avoid train wrecks, but here's how we ought to run the railroads. And this from the beginning is a chain of blame. It, def it defines the functional responsibility at each level of the organization, and so, so that when the next train wreck happened, we'd know whose fault it was. See, down here, there's Captain Hazelwood, right there. <laughs> and, or his equivalent in 1850. That's what it was meant from the beginning. beginning. That's what it continues to be now. Um, and, and we have to shift from asking the questions that are consistent with this. The questions consistent with this way of thinking are things like, um, whose fault is it when something goes wrong? Uh, who do I, you know, where, how, how can I please my boss? Uh, questions pivoting around this set of expectations here. Um, uh, how, how much can I get away with before I'm in trouble? There's another question consistent with, with the top paradigm. Two, how can we constantly improve? What's important to our customer? When we propose some kind of a change to the organization, will the customer give a rat's tush about this change? Um, how, how can we do a better job of serving not only our external customers, but our internal customers? How can we make sure that we, as we give better and better service to our internal customers, we don't do that at the expense of our external customers? Um, and, and, and seeing ourselves as this interdependent series of steps and activities that lead ultimately to the customer. And the questions that were maybe appropriate for this way of thinking are obsolete now. We have a different set of questions. A lot of them having to do with what does the customer want and how can we improve? And also questions dealing with data, because data is our best way of understanding the system and its capabilities. Now, let me move on to, let me talk about this one in connection with principle number two. Um, the wider implications of looking at things as a system requires a new way of viewing partnerships. 
uh, the, most, the most dramatic example I have of this, this one, uh, you can, uh, this has to do with uh, the police department of the city of Madison. And I want you to imagine being a group of people in Moscow, in the Kremlin itself, where I gave the talk, hearing this. Um, if you can imagine, if you can sort of slip into that mentality as much as you understand it. But at any rate, this, the city of Madison Police Department does customer surveys in which they find out from not only the victims of crime how well they were treated, but they find out from the perpetrators of crime how well they were treated. That is part of the system, part of the partnership, part of the win-win situation involves involves those who are those who are the objects of the arrest process. It's the, the question is not do you think you got a bum rap, do you think you deserve to be arrested, but is there anything from your perspective that we can do to improve this process? Now that so it's sort of a it's sort of a, a, a dramatic extension of customer in thinking, but it's also looking at the system as having a wider purview than just simply uh, this you know, the, the, the beneficiaries of a, of, a, of a system. I think we need to, to look upon our systems in a much broader perspective. We need to not only different kinds of partnerships with the workers where there was previously adversarial relationships, but we have to have different relationships with suppliers. That's a little easier to see perhaps with regulators. In Wisconsin, because the state of Wisconsin was practicing um, total quality management, uh, the, the revenue department, uh, one of whose responsibilities was to regulate the liquor industry in Wisconsin. You can imagine there are quite a few breweries who have a vested interest in not being over-regulated. For years, that relationship between the Wisconsin state regulators and the liquor industry in Wisconsin was an adversarial relationship. They hated each other. They saw each, each other as inevitably having cross-purposes. And yet the state of Wisconsin people were able to rethink how they worked with the liquor industry and they sat down and developed a win-win approach to, to, uh, to approaching regulations and, regu and those regulatory responsibilities. I think Sue Rowan might talk a little bit about that this afternoon. Is that this afternoon or is that tomorrow, Sue? Tomorrow. Um, partnership with customers is, is obvious and even partnership with competitors. We, it seems to me that we, we compete ar around the wrong things a lot. I often wonder, when, when you travel a lot like we do, you, you buy rental cars, and why should I have to relearn how to buckle a seat belt every time, and how to open a door, and how to start a car, and how to remove a key from the ignition? What advantage is there for each model to have a different way of doing that? And especially when sometimes when I need, if, if there was some emergency and I need to get out of the car in a hurry, do I have to pull out the owner, owner's manual to figure out now how do I, how do I get out of this car? Um, sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not. I have, I have shared stories with other car renters about how complicated it can be. The whole climate of teamwork, we have to rethink who's on our side and broaden the definition of who's on our side. I want, to, I want to give credit to Gypsy Rainey for something. Let me talk about learning curves. Principle number four is talking about improvement, improvement and change. First of all, let me start by, by talking about the, the learning curve. Uh, we, we know the classic learning curve to be something like this, maybe a slight decrease of productivity, but rapid learning which gradually tapers off. That's sort of the classic learning curve. Well. Oops. There's something to be improved is the way these things scroll. The, the, the folks who are buying our real estate know how to take advantage of innovation and then from that point spend most of their energies and time improving on what they've got, then occasionally using innovation to leapfrog and so forth. That's, that's where innovation fits into the scheme. Here, uh, as I learned from Gypsy Rainey, here's sort of the conventional American learning curve. It's a series of unattached individual aborted learning curves. It's an organization without memory. It's an organization which has a vacancy in a supervisory position and because 
the, the responsibilities and processes that are attached to that position have not been put down on paper. Somebody new comes in, has nothing to learn from, and in any way, in any event, what's rewarded is showing that you're a self-starter and you can take an organization in chaos and rescue it. So there's no relationship to the previous supervisory administration. This is a picture of the organization which will sit down to do its 1993 plan without looking at the 1992 plan or what was what, what benefits they got from it or what things they failed to achieve, nor will they look at the 1992 planning process to see how the planning process itself can be reviewed. We do this constantly. We, we pretend like everything we do is single events unrelated to the past. And it's why we commonly have the same problems occurring over and over and over. Thank you, Gypsy. I use that all the time. And I give you credit for it, and I apologize for your name not being on the, uh, the page. It, it often is. I don't know why it's not there today. Now let me talk about giving the organization direction and focus. Principle number five. This is a sketch that I drew, actually, when we were having a sort of a, a clinic session. We were talking about a client. Um, and this client, we were working with a group of managers, had spent about six or eight months, 10 months with them. Nothing much seemed to have happened. Um, they seemed to understand what was going on. Uh, although there's one other learning curve I should share with you in this context. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the TQM learning curve, which goes sort of like this. Uh, uh, a rapid increase in apparent learning until managers understand enough to know that they don't know anything, and then the real learning curve takes place. That's not cynical. That's an observation of over years of many organizations uh, where the first learning curve involves learning the rhetoric. It's filled with good intentions. They're not evil, phony people. They're just folks who want it to be simple and who have not yet allowed the complexity and depth of total quality to become internalized. And so they do the best they can um, until at some point something makes its way through their consciousness and they realize that this, there's something different going on here that I've got to pay attention to. Uh, Dr. Deming calls it, I think, the shift from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. And, and I, at one time, was saying that this takes about a year. And I had an opportunity to give a lecture in Dr. Kano's class at Tokyo Science University. And I shared this thought. And Dr. Kano raised his hand and said, uh, Mr. Schultes, you said that that first learning curve takes about a year. And I, I know enough about the questions that the Japanese teachers asked to know I was in trouble. The very fact that he asked the question told me I was in trouble. Um, and I just didn't know what kind of trouble. And, and so I said, yes, Dr. Kano, I think it takes about a year. And he nodded his head and he said, you must be very good. <laughs> I was about to wave the white flag and say, OK, OK. He said, I think, I think it takes about three years. So any of you who raised your hand when I said, uh, uh, you've been at this three years or longer, you may be past the first learning curve. If you've been at this for less than three years, your organizations, and maybe you personally, may be going through something that feels like you're learning about total quality, but what you don't know exceeds, dramatically exceeds what you do know. I don't mean that to be discouraging. In fact, I want you to use this to let yourselves be patient with yourselves. You're going through something that's difficult to internalize and to make habitual. You're trying to develop reflexes. And a lot of, a lot of what you used to know you, it crowds out the new philosophy. And it's, hard to, and it's hard to see this for what it is. It's hard to internalize systems thinking. It's hard to reflexively say when somebody asks you how much your shoes cost to say, like Ben, whoever it was, said, I don't know, I haven't finished wearing them yet. So getting back to uh, this. So this organization, I, I realized later, it was partly experience with this and other organizations um, led me to, to understand that there's this learning curve that we just 
have no easy way to get around. So here's the organization. We were wondering why they weren't doing anything. Well, the, the people we were talking about were these folks here. They weren't doing anything because these people weren't doing anything. These folks wanted to do something, but they were waiting for the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer to let go of their obsession with quarterly profits. And as a result, these folks weren't going to bypass the whole leadership group and travel down the route toward Deming's philosophy. Uh, my point here is that, is that I think we tend to underappreciate how much leaderlessness comes from the top of our organization. Directionlessness comes from the directionlessness at the top. And business, businessmen I hear complain about workers who are unmotivated. The trouble with workers today is that they're unmotivated. Well, this is what's behind, I believe, most of the lack of motivation in American workers. We need to have some way to galvanize and focus the efforts of our workers. And so I want to present to you a, just a quick lick and a prayer version of, of uh, ways to give that direction to the organization. On page nine, there's a set of direction giving statements. And I, I don't necessarily propose these in the chronicle or, chronological order in which they ought to be done, but, but this is sort of a comprehensive set. Uh, the first is the vision and mission of the enterprise. Uh, I worry that sometimes managers sit down and spend the first two months of their total quality program carving out a, a vision statement. And without profound knowledge, the vision statement or the mission statement won't be much. At best, it'll probably be a restatement of Dr. Deming's 14 points. At any rate, it usually gets done and it's over with and it sits on a shelf and is never referred to again because the organization still has the same gypsy rainy learning curve where, where we do a vision statement and then we don't make any reference to it. At any rate, this is important, but it's important to do it when the organization has gone through the first learning curve, I believe. The operating philosophy and values is important too. It says, this says what business we're in, what we're doing, what we're trying to achieve, how we're trying to achieve it. Long-term plans are important, but most of us don't know enough to do that kind of long-term planning. Um, Ed Baker of Ford told me this. Mazda has a long-term plan, and you know how long their long-term plan is? It's 200 years ahead. And I said, Ed, is this year's 200-year plan much different than last year's 200-year plan? <laughs> Um, the, the, I think the point is this, that you, it's legitimate to ask the question, and whether you say 200 years or 100 years, but it's legitimate to ask the question that given the capabilities we're trying to sell to our customers, what are the events, technological or ecological, uh, that are going to be occurring 100 years or so from now that are going to affect how we provide that capability. How do we provide, let's say, if we're the manufacturers of fuel injector systems, how do we provide the capability to accelerate engines in a day when there are no more fossil fuels? It's worth asking that question, and it may take decades to come up with the, with the replacement technology, but if we want to stay in business, we've got to think in those terms. Now we get into a few things that are a little bit more practical. Midterm goals and plans, maybe three-year duration goals and plans. That's still a stretch for a lot of organizations. Annual plans, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how to come up with annual improvement plans, which are translated to each local site. There's another whole area, documented and standardized methods and operational definitions of quality, that I don't have time to talk about, but these are the kind of things that give direction to the workforce. If you've ever seen things like QC process charts, very specific, detailed flow charts of the work of a task that have not only a, a column that describes the sequence of steps for each task, but in parallel columns with it, it says, here's, by the way, here's what you measure. Here are the key process indicators that we know from experience have to be monitored very carefully. So here's what data you take. For instance, if, th if the temperature of a certain, uh, at a certain point in the process is important, here's where you, where you take the, the, 
the temperature reading of this process, and here's how you record that data so that you can use some kind of a control chart to tell you that whether the process is in control or not. That's what's involved in the document and standardized methods. Much more detailed than we are used to doing. Let me give you an example of a, of a standardization method, for instance, in one Japanese factory that I heard about. Um, the, the standardized method had to do with lubricating the machines. And at, you would go up to a machine, and even though the sign was in Japanese, it was easy enough because of the pictures that were drawn to tell what they were trying to say. The, the picture hanging on the side of this large machine showed a particular part right there on the machine, and it showed an oil can touching that part of the machine that needed to be lubricated. So that anybody, even new to the job, could stand there, look at the sign, read the instructions, and know how to lubricate that particular step. But not only was that part of the instructions, and all of this is not just arbitrary rules and regulations. These are the results of studies being done on the best way to do this. On the floor next to that machine were, were footprints on the floor, and that's where you're supposed to stand because their studies have shown that if you stand here and hold the can the way the picture says, that's how you can get the best angle to lubricate that particular part of the machine. That's the kind of detail, the standardized detail that we go into. Now, somebody asked me once, what's the difference between that and Taylorism? Well, the difference between that and Taylorism is that in Taylor's time, the industrial engineers, the specialists would come in and do the time studies and the motion studies and the other kinds of technical studies, and they would dictate to the workforce how, what the best way to do the job is. Here, the workers do the studies. The workers are constantly looking for better methods to do their jobs. They standardize the best method they know, and then meanwhile, in another time and another place, they look for a better method to do it. So that's a way of giving direction to the workforce. But let me talk about how to plan for improvement. And a really quick and dirty version of it begins on page 10. I, and again, this is the ideal. And, and when you see this, you'll see how far we've got to go in this country to get close to this. But what we take things like the vision statement and the mission statement uh, and, the, and the philosophy and the long-term goals, all of that is part of our thinking that's incorporated in this. But every year, we look at different kinds of data that's important to us. The voice of the customer, customer needs, or how they apply, what capabilities they're looking for, or what their complaints are. My observation in a lot of companies that I do business with as a consumer is that when you, make, when you have a complaint, uh, the person you talk to is seldom, um, seldom sees himself or herself as the appropriate agent for recording that complaint and, and taking it to wherever in the organization is an appropriate place to bring a complaint. Often, if you, say, make a complaint at a, at a counter at an airport, they'll say, here, fill out this form. Um, or they'll say, well, I, you have to talk to somebody else. Or, or they'll say, oh, that's great. Smile, say, sorry for the inconvenience, but there will be nothing on, in writing, and you know that that complaint will go no further. So we need to find ways to capture complaints. We need to systematize the complaints that we hear so that they can be incorporated into the system. So that when I, as a consumer, say, this is what went wrong, I know that that information is going to go someplace. Those are all treasures that we lose. Customer complaints are treasures. As one of our clients said, we've got this, uh, we, we had taught him to call complaints opportunities. Complaints, no, complaints are treasures and problems are opportunities. And he said, we have this endless list of insurmountable opportunities, a mountain of treasures. And we haven't learned how to climb it. We also need to find out um, what are some of the benchmarks. Now, the, the, the benchmarks are dangerous. They cut two ways. Benchmarks will tell you when you're in deep trouble. They'll tell you when your customers can get something better from your uh, competitors. The Baldridge Prize uh, makes a big deal out of the benchmarks. I think perhaps too big a deal. It's, it's OK to take a look at that, but don't measure your quality against your competitors by benchmarking everything. You want them to be benchmarking against you. You don't want to be benchmarking against them. There's also the voice of the process. Is it in control? Is it out of control? There's the voice of the employees. The employees are the ones who are, can tell us the most about the workability of our systems. Do they have materials they can work with? Do they have equipment they can work with? 
How do the policies help or hinder them in doing work that they're proud of? It's an invaluable source of information if we ask the right questions and, and use that data to help our planning process. Waste, loss, defects is important data to keep track of. The voice of the stakeholders, the other people who care about our systems and how well they function. If we take all this data and sort it out, we should come up with a few priorities, just a few themes, two, one, maybe three, if we're really good at it, themes for improvement in the following year. I know companies that have as many as 80 priorities and they wonder why at the end of the year they haven't done any of them. Um, we, let's just do a few, and, and as Dr. Kano says, let's go an inch wide and a mile deep. And then use something like the tree diagram to take a priority and ask the question, what will it take to successfully accomplish that? Now here's the difference between MBO and this kind of planning. MBO would make the wish list of objectives and then the manager would say to the subordinates, okay, now go out and make my wishes come true. And you'll be evaluated on the basis of whether you make my wishes come true or not. In, in, in this kind of planning, the, we don't stop there with the identification of the objective. We keep asking the question, what will it take to successfully accomplish that? And then we ask it again, what will it take to accomplish that? And again, what will it take to accomplish that? Until we have finally identified the specific activities or projects or initiatives that will take place. The tree diagram works in two ways. We go this direction in order to, to identify what will be necessary in order to accomplish some worthwhile high priority business goal. We can use the tree diagram the other direction so that when somebody says to us, uh, here's what I'm engaged in, here's the project that I'm doing, can ask the question, why are you doing that? What's the purpose of that? They are any specific activity in your company. If I came to your company and you were presenting a project to me, I would hope that I could ask what the purpose of the project was and what the purpose of that purpose was so that I, using tree diagram thinking, could trace everything you're doing, every improvement effort you're making to some greater important to the business overriding goal. If all of your projects aren't related to some major business goal, then why are you doing them? You don't have time for maverick projects. And it doesn't make sense to do a bunch of uh, uh, isolated projects which are not linked to other efforts that will accomplish some major goal. So, so again, this is, this is an attempt to harness and discipline our improvement efforts so that we are not victims of what I described before as these collect, this, this collection of, of improvement efforts which individually are nice things to do but collectively go nowhere. Here, collectively, they go somewhere in a very specifically defined and described way. I think the tree diagram is wonderful. It's a great tool. You'll see on page 12, it spells it out some more. Here's, here's where it's important to know different methodologies for improvement because not all of these projects will be done the same way. It'll take various kinds of uh, strategies or logic. Some of them can be just done with the stroke of a pen. Others might take a designed experiment. Others may take some very elaborate and sophisticated improvement methodology. There's no substitute for knowing how to improve. Um, and then at the bottom of page 10 is a a way of cataloging all those efforts that ties them together. So, I am going to just summarize and then leave the rest to questions. Um, but you'll notice on page 13, the paradigm of leadership involves this. We, we're focusing on customer satisfaction, not management satisfaction. We're focusing on the performance of the system, not the performance of the individuals in the system. We're focusing on improvement, not change. It's my belief that 95% of the changes that I have witnessed in organizations were not changes at all. They were just changes, they were not improvements. 95%, you think of the time you could save if you eliminated all those changes in your organizations which were not improvements. So, do we want to improve systems the system's performance in order to increase customer satisfaction, or do we want to 
change individual performance in order to increase management satisfaction. That's, I think, the paradigm shift. And the systems that we need to put in place in order to do that are elaborated on the following pages, but they're relatively self-explanatory. And I think at this point, what might be more useful is to allow you to uh, five minutes or so to ask a couple of questions. So we could all go to lunch or something early if there were no questions, but I, I'd rather answer a couple of questions. Again, the, uh, the rules for questions, I guess, the procedure. If you have questions, go to one of the microphones in the aisle and uh, state your name, organization, ask the question when I point to you. We've got one now. Yep. Yes. You, you, over here. You, you mentioned uh, standardization and the frustration you have having to relearn every time you uh, rent a car, how, how to put on a seatbelt and so on. I have the same frustration with quality professionals. Um, I have to keep relearning terms. Dr. Deming told us this morning about aim and purpose. A system has to have an aim or a purpose. You talk about vision, mission, operating philosophy, values. C can you help me understand how those are related to the aim and purpose? If I'm trying to optimize my system, do I optimize based on my vision, mission? Is that the aim and purpose? I yeah, to, you hoist me on my own petard, hey? <laughs> You know what? I can't even tell where you're standing. Could I have the house lights up a little bit? Would that be a problem? I want to, I want to see who's asking these questions. Uh, <laughs> is that you over there? No, no? he's over to your left, Peter. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm a green okay. shirt. Um, I don't know what to say in response to your question. I think it's a legitimate point, and I think we ought to work harder at, at standardizing our own jargon, our own terminology. Uh, when Dr. Deming talks about that every system has to have an aim, otherwise it's not a system, um, I see that as a challenge to define the systems we have in a variety of ways. So I talk about all those things, the vision statement, um, mission statements, value statements, as different ways of defining the system and its aims. And I guess for me the usefulness of that is that um, they all mean slightly different things. The nuance is slightly different. So my hope is that they will trigger different ways of thinking about the organization. Um, I, it, until you asked the question, it didn't occur to me that that, in fact, could, could, could create some uh, ambiguity uh, for folks and some confusion. Um, one of the difficulties in this country is that we don't have an organization like JUICE that acts as a sort of central uh, uh, standardizing agent for the, for the total quality movement in this country. Uh, our, our, our movement is much more uh, dispersed. We've got different quote unquote gurus. We've got different jargons. And it's not standardized. And we're suffering from that, I, I'm afraid. And as a result, people will dabble in this philosophy or dabble in that philosophy. And it doesn't work. And they'll say, well, we tried it. And it doesn't work in our organization. So let's go to ISO 9000 and see what we can do with that. I don't have a good answer to your question. Have another question? again with an easier question, and I'll answer it for you. <laughs> Peter, another question over here. Yes. My name is Jack Jank. I work for a consulting engineering firm in Albany, New York. Yes. And in your sixth uh, principle, you appear to use the words leadership and management interchangeably. Yeah. There I are many who right now uh, say there's a difference between the two. I don't know whether you agree with that or not. Uh, if you don't, why not? If you do, how would this be modified to account for that? I, I, I don't use them interchangeably, though it may appear that to be that way. But I think they're both important. They aren't the same thing, but you need both. Different ways to lead and different ways to manage. The, the, my, my easiest way to, to, to describe the difference is that um, <laughs> Moses led the exodus. He didn't manage the exodus. Though there were those among them who did manage the exodus, and that was important because after all, the people had to, to eat and sleep and take care of their daily necessities, um, but that wasn't what the leadership role was. So I think, uh, so most of my comments are, have to do, in, in the more global philosophical ways, have to do with some of the nature of the leadership role. The management role has more to do with the day-to-day -day, uh, what the Japanese would call 
quality and daily work, which describes roughly 80% of what you do, and also the nitty-gritty mechanics of improvement, which would represent the 20% of what you do. Don't hold, hold me to the 80%, 20% formula. It's just a rough way of saying how, how to divide up your job. If you look at the Kaizen illustration that's in the notes under the principle regarding improvement, it shows a, a rough distribution of manage of the different kinds of jobs, some of them having to do with maintaining the current situation, some having to do with improving the situ current situation, some having to do with innovation. Um, I would say maintaining the current situation is clearly a management kind of function, all a variety of functions related to management role. Innovation has, is clearly a, a leadership role. Improvement involves both. Here in the middle? Yes. Barry Ballard from uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. You made the comment that uh, empowerment of workers really only makes sense in a hierarchical organization yes. and really is not appropriate in an organization that is committed to, to systems thinking and working as a system. But it seems to me that you know, all of us who are getting started in this quality of business, we start out in hierarchical organizations. And w isn't it appropriate to use this as a vehicle where you focus empowerment on improvement of the process consistent with improving the entire system where the workers now feel that they have an important part to contribute to the process that they're listened to and as management sees that this is a valuable resource this leads sort of the whole organization towards systems thinking and process improvement is that is that a reasonable way to phrase that or am i well it, it it makes sense but it still makes me nervous i mean i, I understand what you're saying after all that is where our starting point is hierarchical but I, I, I see the word empowerment as a fashionable word, um, uh, sort of faddish. I, 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 when I hear it used, it's never clear to me what it means. I worry that when it's used, it's a, it's a set of sort of token activities that once again allow managers to uh, abdicate their role. If indeed we're starting and we are with hierarchical organizations, there are other things I would rather see managers do to change the hierarchy. I would rather have managers define the processes and systems, as Dr. Deming says, using either, either more generalized flowcharts and then more specific flowcharts and define in not just internal customer supplier relationships, those are important, but how each of those relationships relate to the outside customer. Start with that kind of thinking. That's not empowerment, I don't think. I think eventually if you do the right things, the issue of power won't become a power, but it won't become an issue. Um, uh, maybe I'm overreacting to it, but I think I'm overreacting to it partly because it has become such a, such a cure-all word, and I don't think it means anything. Well, I think the, the danger is that it becomes, it, it is, as you point out, it's taken to uh, be management abdicating its, its authority, but how else do you really get the people at the working level to buy into the process and the system unless they realize that they're an important contributor and I recognize My experience has been that it's not trouble to get the people to buy into the processes in the system. It's much harder to get the managers to buy into the process in the system. People have an in, a, a more instinctive understanding of the dependent sequence of activities and that what they get from somewhere else in the system is either going to help them do a better job or get in the way of them doing a good job. I mean, they, they experience that day in and day out. It's at the higher levels of the organization that where we lose a kind of sensitivity to the system, where we make decisions for this part of the system that screw up that part of the system. The people in that part of the system know that something's screwed up. They just don't know how, how come it's screwed up. I'm just, I, I think it's a, it's, we tend to go to faddish, simplistic solutions, and I fear, I think I'm pr right on this one, that that's another, yet another faddish, simplistic response, and it'll give quality a bad name. Dave? How are we doing on time, Ben? Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to let go a little bit longer, and I expect everybody to eat a little bit faster during the lunch <laughs> hour. But I, I think this is worth it. We'll take an extra couple of minutes here. Don't We've get still got started. questions on the floor. Dave? Hello. I'm Dave Engelbert. I'm with Navistar International Transportation Corporation. Um, I look at your tree, tree diagram, yes. and I have some concern if all I do is study my current system and I go up or down on the tree diagram, I may very well only find myself reaffirming what I'm doing today without actually examining how is that in contrast to what an organization needs to do to adopt a new paradigm. 
the tree diagram is, is a tool that's most useful in uh, identifying how to engage in improvement. So I wouldn't say a tree diagram on your current system necessarily. There may be some implications for your current system. Tree diagram does not produce knowledge, does not bring anything new in. You want to repeat that, Dr. Deming, with a microphone in front of you? The, uh, tree diagram does not produce knowledge. You can dig and dig and dig, uh, work harder and harder, do best efforts, only dig to the pit deeper that they're already in. Especially if you're focusing on a current dysfunctional system. But if our goal is to reduce uh, the cycle time in developing some product, uh, dramatically reduce the cycle time, then we have to ask, how can we do that? What will it take to do that? We use our subject matter expertise and... Harder work will not do it. Hard right. work and best efforts will not do it. Yeah. It's outside knowledge. Yep. And, and the tree diagram, it seems to me, ideally ought to identify not solutions, but problems that have to be solved, projects that have to be undertaken, policies that have to be changed, and things of that nature. If we, if we approach a tree diagram without profound knowledge, we're liable to have some of the branches of the tree be culprits that we have to punish for instance, and that would be a disaster. You'd be better off not doing that. So is it basically then without, without a change in objectives, without a change in the goal, going through the t diagram may not produce, produce any knowledge with inside an organization? Yes, and my way of thinking, it's meant for dealing with uh, breakthrough improvements, not the little incremental improvements, but breakthrough improvements in the current system. In, the effect, in effect, uh, innovation or uh, you know, some dramatic scale of improvement. And that's why you shouldn't do too many of them in a year. Thank you. Question over on this left side here, Peter's left side. Uh, Jim Thompson from Procter & Gamble. Another question about the tree diagram. If your tree diagram started from one to three themes or key important business uh, focus areas, I'd like to link that, if I can, to Dr. Deming's flowchart. Uh, would it be appropriate in your way of thinking to set one to three themes in areas of reduced cost or improved productivity uh, rather than uh, an improvement of quality in some nature and then expand the tree diagram from there? I get nervous about any of those products or those projects or those improvements that will mean nothing to the customers. Um, the, uh, I, you're asking a complicated question, there's not much time to answer it, but I, I guess I could imagine people who have profound knowledge sitting down and figuring out a way to approach increased productivity or reduce costs in a way that will be faithful to the, to the um, uh, chain reaction in a way that will respect the integrity of the systems and, and not uh, cause uh, discomfort or pain or inconvenience or any lessening of service to the customer. Anybody can cut costs, simplest thing in the world. What does it do to the customer? What does it do to the organization? What does it do to your future? I had a client that, that was faced with a situation where a lot of workers would be laid off because of a loss of, of the market due to the recession. Oh, and, and they set about improving, they set about making improvements for the purposes of cutting costs. But they had been learning Dr. Deming's philosophy for four years. They had developed a, a core of internal people who were technically proficient at statistical studies, for instance, and statistical applications. And, and they sat down and very carefully identified areas that were worth exploring um, because they suspected there were some, some savings to be made there. Things like uh, um, being more careful about the weight of incoming shipments, I remember, was one of them. And at any rate, um, they knew that if they wanted to keep uh, a shift of people from being laid off, they needed to accomplish, I think it was $60,000 a month in savings. And they were able to accomplish $250,000 a month in savings. Um, 
uh, 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 with no compromise in the quality of the product whatsoever, no compromise in the service to the customers whatsoever, and in fact, it ended up improving the systems, not deteriorating the system. So they didn't do it by cutting corners. They did it by being much more precise and careful about what they did. Let's try one more question here in the middle. Okay. My name is Jay Stair from Robbins, and we're relatively early on in our journey, but you touched on a subject in the beginning of your talk about how the talk of continuous improvement or calling it that makes you nervous. We just had a discussion in our organization. We began calling it total quality management, and we decided to shift away from that because it didn't seem to be more of a buzzword or more intimidating to our hourly uh, and lower uh, position workers. And the thought of continuous process improvement when it incorporates the foundations of, you know, how do we analyze our customers, what are their needs, how does that flow backwards. Uh, could you elaborate more on that, on the nervousness of it's that? It's another thing that I'm probably making too big a deal of. I, I, have, uh, I have often seen managers in the early stages of this spend lots of time deciding what to call it. It's one of those areas where we don't have something standardized. In Japan, they call it TQC, almost every, every place. The total quality control makes Americans nervous, that title, so we don't call it that. It appears that TQM is becoming the uh, coin of the realm, um, and it almost doesn't matter. Call it Fred or something like that. I would rather have you do it than worry about what to call it. But, but, when you, but the implication of continuous improvement, and this is what makes me nervous about it, the implication of a continuous improvement is that, it, that there that it doesn't involve things that happen before a product is ever uh, designed or, 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 or that happens at the higher levels of the organization. That's what makes me nervous about it. There's nothing wrong with it, it just, you know, I find lots of things to get nervous about. Maybe what I need to do is to find some way to not get so nervous about those things. But I, here's what, the, the overall thing that makes me nervous, and this might be a good place to stop, we, in this country, I fear we're diddling around with quality and thinking we're doing it. And my observation is that for most American companies, including those that are earnestly pursuing some form of FRED or whatever it's called, <laughs> that, that, that we're only barely in the foothills and yet we think we're scaling the heights and Japan's not waiting for us to catch up. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter.